Hey, it's Coach Taylor here for SmarterTeamTraining.com. I'm excited to say that uh, I've been reaching out on social media and, and asking people who they want to hear from. I get a, a phone call and a text from a, a good friend of mine, and he says, you've got to get this guy named Dr. Trent Nestler on the show. He says he's a, he's a big league dude, uh, but even a better person. And I said, well, let's do it, man. I believe in you, and uh, I'm looking forward to inspiring greatness with, you know, with and, th- and through others. So, uh, Trent, man, I'm really excited about our phone conversations even before this opportunity, obviously, our emails going back and forth have been awesome, and I'm looking forward to just talking shop and having you involved with the project here, my man. Well, thank you very much for having me. It's, it's an honor. I know we've talked a lot about what you do and, and, and how you're doing it, to be very honest with everybody that's listening to the show, but you and I really haven't talked about who you are as a person. I mean, can you do me a favor and, and tell me a little bit about where your passion comes from and, and a little bit about what makes you tick, my man? Sure. You know, I've always been into fitness, always been into athletics, became a physical therapist uh, over 15 years ago. And that really came from uh, what I feel was something I was very drawn and called to do. My current area of interest is movement assessment. And this really started as a foundation or started as a result of treating a bunch of kids. You know, I had a large practice in Phoenix, saw over... 22 ACL reconstructions in a two-week period of time and really felt compelled and called to do something about it. And that was uh, over 12 years ago, and uh, it's been a long uh, road and a lot of great things and a lot of great people I've met as a result of it and has led to what we're doing today. We talked a lot about uh, injuries and injury potential and injury rates leading up to the show, uh, again, on, on phone conversations prior to this. And uh, I appreciate you taking some time out of your day, obviously, to, to share some of your insights there. Uh, as a strength conditioning coach, one of my questions is going to be pretty blatantly obvious, obvious to you, I guess. Is there anything that can be done in a strength conditioning program to lessen the likelihood, likelihood uh, of any traumatic injury? And, and if you want to talk about ACLs and, and, and the knee area as a whole, uh, I have no problem, you know, discussing that concept. But is there anything that we can do as strength conditioning coaches, personal trainers, uh, even sport coaches, parents for that matter, to potentially lessen the the, the risk of injury in, in in that joint area? Absolutely. You know, and and uh, as as a company, our company's name is ACL, and, and people always ask me why we focus on the ACL. And it simply comes down to the fact that there's just been such a plethora of research and information has been published about the mechanics associated with it in ACL. But if you look at those same mechanics, those same mechanics are associated with labral tears in the hip, low back pain in athletes, knee pain in athletes, ankle, non-contact ankle injuries in athletes. And so so for me, you know, one of the things that we've always focused on are what are those mechanics that are associated with ACLs. And the really interesting thing is in, in, that we find in in our research is that if you improve those mechanics, not only do you reduce ACL, non-contact ACL injuries, but you also reduce all other non-contact injuries by over 58%. The really cool thing is, is that, you know, we, we've been seeing that in our research and development, but now you're also seeing that in published papers. You know, the other the other aspect that I've always felt, and I'm sure, you know, any of the listeners have felt as well, is that, gosh, man, if you improve movement, you improve the efficiency of movement, you not only reduce injury risk, but you also improve performance. And that's exactly what we have seen. That's exactly what the papers are showing, but it's exactly what we're seeing also with our results. And the really cool thing is, is that now you can tie injury prevention to improvement in sprint speed improvement in vertical jump, improvement in power output. And when you can tie those two things together, you know, the compliance of, of programs, injury prevention programs across the spectrum uh, is, is much, much greater. Are there things that we can do? Absolutely. And first and foremost is making sure that we are assessing movement. You know, if we can assess movement in a standardized way and really get to what I call the root cause. You know, we can all see that the knee does this or the knee does that, but what is the root cause of that knee doing that? And if we address that root cause, then we see improvements in uh, performance, but also uh, reduction uh, in injury rates. Anytime you talk about the ACL or the knee as a whole, uh, people are going to 
jump to the whole uh, quad to hamstring ratio and their, and their relationship as far as how they protect the knee, how they uh, are friendly to the knee, how they're not friendly, that maybe even the enemy of the knee as a, as far as the ligaments go, and then and basically the ACL as a, as a ligament uh, as a whole. Uh, I mean, how important is the strength of the hamstring quad and, and that collective re- relationship and, and the information that you've seen? This is probably a, a little bit of a controversial statement, and you know we we. We never venture away from controversial because it, it, it begs the question. It's thinking outside the box. You know, one of the things that we have seen in our research, a deviation that we term a lateral shift. And a lateral shift is simply a lateral displacement of the pelvis during a squatting motion. Now, it's really interesting. We've, we've seen this in high school athletes. We've seen it in college athletes. We've seen it in Olympic athletes. And we've seen it in professional athletes. And it makes sense that if you see someone who's got a lateral displacement of the pelvis during a squatting motion, where they are shifting their weight to one side more than the other, that there is no way that their quadriceps and their hamstrings are going to be of equal size or strength compared to the contralateral side. It just can't happen because they not only carry that over with their training, they carry it over every time they sit on the commode, they get off their bed, they get out of their car. All of those things that they do, all of those squatting motions that they do, that motion is carried through. So my, I beg the question of, well, okay, the quads and the hamstrings are, they, there's, a, there's a difference there. But why? Why? Why is that difference there? Because if, if the system was loaded symmetrically, it would make sense that the quads and the hamstrings should be in the right ratio. But if you look back at the root cause, or if you look back at what is the movement that's causing that difference, it would make sense to me that, well, yes. So, so my question is always when, I, when, when people ask me that, well, is it, is it a result or is it a cause? And, you know, from what I see in the literature, from what we see when we do movement assessments, yes, you will see quad and hamstring differences. But if someone's got a lateral shift, that's to be expected. And are those quads and hamstring differences the result of a bad la- uh, landing pattern or, or jumping pattern more so than just an innate weakness? And I would say it's probably the other. Because if we can get them to move correctly, get them to not have a shift, get them to land correctly, that goes away. What role does the gluteal muscles as a whole, that whole complex we'll call it, having controlling a valgus motion uh, or even uh, adduction and internal rotation movement at the knee? The glutes play a critical role in, in you know, the... You know, Hewitt and Powers and, and uh, others have, have published numerous papers related to the impact of the glutes and the impact on the lower kinetic chain and closed kinetic chain types of activities. Obviously, you know, there's been a lot of focus on the glute max, and there's been a lot of focus on the glute medius. Along with that, and I, I, we agree with that 110%, you know, and uh, especially glute medius, if the glute medius is weak in a closed kinetic chain with landing, the femur will move into an adducted position. And if it moves in a closed kinetic chain, because it's closed, if it moves to a large enough degree of adduction, then there's going to be some component of internal rotation. And in a closed kinetic chain, the glute medius, by its, its uh, uh, origin and insertion and fiber orientation is the direct resistance to that. But the other thing, though, that's interesting and that, that we're starting to see more papers come out about and that we see a lot is proprioception. So, you know, you had asked about if there's one thing that, um, that is, is strength coaches that we could do for injury prevention. And I would say the one clinical pearl is that if we can give an athlete the ability to discern the difference between lumbar motion and hip motion, that you give them that proprioception at the hip, they get that proprioception at the hip, you will reduce a lot of injuries. Because what we see, and especially in our female soccer players, 
is that we call it a lumbopelvic dissociation. We teach them how to, to discern the difference between lumbar motion and hip motion. And as soon as we can do that in single plane and multiple planes, we have a progression that we go through, but as soon as we can teach that in a single plane and multiple planes, that their ability to control their hips when they land, their ability to control their knee when they land, is greatly enhanced. I want to talk a little bit about that concept of the core and how it relates to uh, what we'll call landing mechanics, or mechanics as a whole, whether it's cutting, jumping, spinning, rotating, uh, athletic movement as a whole. I mean, what role does the core, and we'll call that from the, the ribs to the, the top of the pelvis or even uh, the ribs to the bottom of the glute type scenario, and so sure. we can include the hip a little bit. I mean, what role does the, the core play in ACL management uh, from the jump, landing, and cutting standpoint? It's interesting that you ask that because that is one of the reasons, it's part of the reason that we ended up developing the movement assessment that we did. Because we felt like when we looked at the research, that the research was very, very clear and it's been very clear for a long time on the contribution of the core to ability to control motion. But yet, most of the movement assessments that we did or do don't isolate out the core in a way uh, that actually challenges the core to see how the core is contributing to that. But uh, there was a, a really good paper that was just published last year in the American Journal of Sports Medicine that talked about uh, weakness of the core and the, the inability to stabilize at the core and how that impacts valgus moment at the knee, uh, which is critical. But if you think of it from a performance perspective, you know, and, and I always think of the pitcher, you know, with pitchers generating so much force through their hips and through their lower kinetic chains, that if that, if there is a weakness in the core and that kinetic energy transfer across the core is lost, then what ends up happening? Well, they end up getting more stress on their rotator cuff, more stress on their labrum, and more stress on the ulnar collateral ligament. So the ability for the core to have good strength, uh, good endurance, and ability to stabilize in multiple planes is a critical part of the whole lower kinetic chain. You know, and, and uh, there's a really good book that was published by Carl DeRosa, uh, and he was, a, he was a mentor of mine, just a phenomenal uh, physical therapist. He's also a PhD uh, in anatomy, and he wrote a book, uh, Mechanical Low Back Pain, and one of the things I always enjoyed about Carl's courses and his books was that he really broke down very complex things into a very easy way to understand it. And uh, I spent a year dissecting out lumbar spine with him, and it was amazing how you tie in even the pecs, uh, the thoracal lumbar fascia, uh, the hips, uh, the, the, the fascia of the quadriceps, and all of that that has some force or, or some force vector that contributes to the stability uh, of the core. So to answer your question, I think it's critical. It's a critical part. Generally speaking, if you're talking ACLs or injuries in general, you're going to go through the strengths conversation and then you're going to go through the mobility conversation. And I want to head down that road just for a second here. I mean, sure. how can we increase the mobility of an ankle or the hips to minimize the forces that are sustained uh, as we're talking about the knee joint as a whole? First and foremost for me, is movement. You know, if if someone has full range of motion, uh, then uh, it, with a, like a squatting motion, they're, they're going to have good mobility of their hips and good mobility of their ankles. And one of the things that it, it's interesting because one of the things that we do with our movement assessment is if someone has a lateral shift, if they are shifting away from, let's say, their right side, that may be the result of a lack of dorsiflexion at their ankle. You know, so, so through a process of elimination, what we try to discern is that a lack of range of motion at their ankle or is that a lack of range of motion at the hip that's causing them to shift away from that side. Once we isolate out what the root cause is, uh, what we do is we tend to go into a lot of dynamic stretches. You know, and I know that that term is used a lot. It's used by a lot of different individuals and to mean a lot of different things. Um, for me, it's movement. Uh, it's, it's mobility with movement. 
we use a lot of manual techniques. We teach a lot of manual techniques in our courses to help facilitate movement in stubborn joints. But for the most part, you know, if people are doing dynamic stretches, and, and we, have a, we have a series of them that we go through, and if they do them correctly, there is no way, if they do them correctly, there is no way that they cannot gain range of motion of their ankle and range of motion of their hips. The only way that they can do, a, and, and unfortunately, this is what I see a lot, is, you know, you get these, uh, you'll get a team out there and they'll be doing dynamic stretches and half of the guys are compensating for their tight hips. Well, that compensation then is carried through throughout all of their dynamic stretches and then when we go and test them again, guess what? Their hips are still tight. So uh, we push it a lot with uh, dynamic stretches. We also have some you know, mobilizations that we'll do for really tight joints or stubborn joints. Um, but for the most part, for most people, we tend to use dynamic stretches. I love them because they're a warm-up, they're uh, strength, they're endurance, their flexibility, you get reciprocal inhibition, so you get a more range of motion with it. I really like using those as a part of my warm-up to create some of that motion. If you're going to talk about mobility, then we're going to talk about the opposite end of this, this sure. spectrum there. And I want to talk a little bit about the ankle as far as that goes and, and the bracing and taping of an athlete's ankle, whether it's, uh, you know, we'll, we'll highlight the sport of basketball for that matter. I mean, sure. uh, anytime an, an athlete or a coach or, uh, you know, anybody for that matter, I mean, you can take a picture sure. of just about 80% of the people that are playing basketball uh, in an organized setting, they're going to have their, either their ankle braced or taped. I mean, does sure. bracing or taping uh, affect an ankle in a negative way? I mean, is it hindering overall movement uh, of not only at the ankle, but is it potentially going up that kinetic chain and, and weakening the opportunity for our knee to be, uh, to, to, en to enable to perform its uh, proper function. Sometimes I think those are somewhat controversial topics because some people feel, feel very strongly one way or the other about it. But I will tell you what the research shows. And, you know, if you look at similar research related to uh, lumbar spine, there was a great uh, uh, study that was done with U uh, UPS workers uh, and when they implemented a weight belt uh, and, uh, uh, you know, the strap-on type of weight belt. And what they found is that when, uh, when UPS workers used these weight belts and they strapped them on, you know, all day long while they were doing their work-related activities, that the EMG activity of the multifidus, which is a primary stabilizer in the lumbar spine, significantly decreased. And then when they took off their belts, guess what? Their multifidus was weak. So they ended up by creating this stability through an external device, actually weakening their muscles. And if you go back as far as 1980, there were studies that showed that, you know, if you put a brace on a knee, guess what? The knee gets weak. And uh, yet, uh, we tend to forget about some of those studies as we move forward. Now, all of that said, I think if someone has a weak ankle, and they are prone to uh, uh, inversion or eversion sprains and strains, then maybe that's the right thing to do. But to do it proactively is you are stabilizing a, a joint. The body is very, very efficient. So uh, in, in what I've always been taught is because of its efficiency, it's going to decrease muscle activity because that support is no longer needed which then weakens the ankle so that when you're not in a brace, you're actually weaker than you would have been had you not used a brace during athletic activities. That being said, at the same time, it greatly changes the mechanics. For example, if you look at the running mechanics of someone with an ACL brace on, when you watch them run, they run differently. And when they run differently, that means that they load joints differently. If they are loading joints differently, it's not loading in the, in the same fashion that it's meant to be loaded, that it's designed to be loaded. Now, that being said, there is, you know, a time frame that most physicians will, you know, uh, encourage the use of a brace. Um, but, uh, you know, after that time, uh, if it's removed, uh, that's better for running gait because then running gait, tends to go back to 
uh, more of a normalized pattern, more of a normalized loading. And if you're if you're keeping the ankle, the ankle requires a lot of uh, dorsiflexion and plantar flexion during the running cycle. And if you're restricting that, that motion has to come from somewhere. So it's either an increase in hip flexion or it's an increase in knee motion, which means then that ground reaction forces are changed, which means that loading patterns are different, which to me would be loading it outside of what it's designed to be loaded. Now, whether that's right or wrong, I don't know. All I know is what the research tells us um, and what what the biomechanics research tells us and what what you know logically makes sense to me based on that information. I want to be as proactive as possible and hopefully keep the, the clients and athletes that I get and uh, am honored to work with uh, an opportunity to perform activities in, in a safe manner and be prepared physically, obviously, for anything that comes comes their way. But if there's a, a way that we can potentially assess or evaluate a potential injury down the road and, and help hopefully catch it uh, before it occurs, uh, I, I would like to make that part of the program. And I mean, what kind of assessments or movement screens are you using to evaluate uh, the, the knee, the jumping line, the mechanics? Uh, sure. Are you doing it while they're fatigued? I mean, that's one big thing that, that really concerns me when you, when we evaluate people that we're always doing it when they're fresh. Sure. And then later on in the game when they're tired, that, that's when the injury occurs. Uh, I mean, can you walk me through a little bit of that process of how you go through that evaluation and assessment? You know, I, I don't want to make this a self-promotion, but that is exactly why we developed the movement assessment that we did. You know, the research tells us, uh, specifically tells us what the movements are. And, you know, what we did is we looked at Hewitt and Powers' work and, and what, what movement do they use in the biomechanics lab to assess movement. And those are the ones that we pulled together as a movement assessment and created a scoring methodology around that. That being said, also taking into consideration what the fatigue literature tells us. And the fatigue literature tells us that as people get tired, their proprioceptive systems get tired, their muscles get tired, and movement changes. So in order, I always felt, in order to really assess movement that is associated with sport, it's got to be physically challenging. And so with like our movement assessment, it consists of 80 repetitions and three one-minute time tests. And what that does is it, it, it allows some of that fatigue factor to feed into the assessment. Now, that is not challenging enough for uh, a, maybe a D1 athlete or an Olympic athlete or a professional athlete. So what we actually did is we actually, uh, for our higher level athletes, because I don't think a movement assessment that I use for my high school kids is going to be as telling when I use it for my professional athletes. I mean, the skill acquisition is totally different. The the level of fitness is totally different. So, so for me, I always felt like, you know what, I need to have something that's going to challenge those folks a little bit more so I can actually see. I don't want to see what they look like when they go on the field. I want to see what they look like when they're in the third quarter of the game. And so what we did is we actually combined it with a research-based fatigue protocol, which is uh, four and a half minutes. Uh, it's the functional agility short-term fatigue protocol. And then we take them through our movement assessment. And what that allows us to see is what they look like when it counts the most, what they look like when they're most likely to get injured, what they are going to look like when performance issues are going to be uh, much greater. Um, and that allows us to make a much more informed decision about not only root cause, but also from a training perspective, what are we going to do to take them up to the next level? Because what we see is that if I had taken that same person through just our regular movement assessment without the fatigue protocol, I might have missed all that. Speaking generally, are there some factors that you've noticed that uh, may indicate a potential for an ACL tear? Yes. And, and, and again, going back to the research from Powers and Hewitt and, and, and many others, I keep mentioning them because they're the, the ones that uh, are the most common out there, is adduction in the frontal plane. You know, uh, Chris Powers recently published a paper that showed that uh, adduction in the frontal plane, the magnitude of adduction in the frontal plane is directly correlated to adduction moment, 
which is directly correlated to injury risk. So, you know, the, the adduction is, is, is a key one. You know, um, and that's one that, that is, drives uh, a major portion of our scoring on our assessment um, uh, because it's so highly correlated to injury risk. That being said, it's also highly correlated to performance. You know, because if you're if you are adducting towards midline with a large magnitude, the kinetic energy loss is great. You know, the force production loss is great. And so both from a injury perspective but also a performance perspective, uh correcting that is is absolutely huge. And people are always like, Well, do you see that in your professional athletes? And I actually uh, tweeted a, a picture of RG3 at Combine, and you can see uh, where he has got significant adduction towards midline, which, you know, even in an elite athlete like that, that I would speculate that if you improve that, that he's going to have some improvement in his vertical jump. He's going to have some improvement in his sprint speed because there is a greater force uh, uh, ability to generate force, but also a greater ability to transfer that kinetic energy across the system. For the coaches, uh, parents, uh, again, teammates for that matter, strength conditioning coaches, personal trainers, PTs, anyone who comes in contact with a client or an athlete who has uh, that uh, poor jumping and landing mechanics, uh, I, I hopefully they're listening to this one question. And I mean, how can we be more proactive in educating? Uh, the people that we get a chance to work with about proper mechanics to minimize the risk of ACL injuries? That's a great question. And and that is the dilemma. You know, uh, and first and foremost is educating people about it. And you'll notice that I keep tying all of this back to performance. And why is that? Because after 15 years of doing this, I find that injury prevention does not sell, unfortunately. You know, uh, there was a recent study that was published that looked at compliance with injury prevention programs, and the compliance among coaches was minimal. Uh, and the reason being is that, you know, coaches are hired to win games. And if you may potentially reduce an injury versus win a game, you're going you're gonna to focus on the things that didn't cause you to win a game. So, so going back to that, uh, one of the things that I always try to do is educate my coaches, my athletes, my, my people that we teach in courses, how all of this influences athletic performance. Because if people can understand that, you know what, if you can reduce this, if you can improve these mechanics, you are going to improve your sprint speed. You are going to improve your vertical jump. You know, and, uh, you know, we've got several keys. Uh, studies that, that, that we've written up, uh, one being of a uh, U.S. Olympic athlete who shaved off two-tenths of a second off of her time. That doesn't sound like that much to a lot of us, but two-tenths of a second is the difference between making the U.S. Olympic team and not making the U.S. Olympic team. And so when, when you're trying to squeeze out, you know, even a, a, a minor amount of performance uh, improvement, uh, mechanics make all the difference in the world, and, it, and if we can tie, if we can teach people how those two are directly correlated, not partially correlated, they are directly correlated. If we can teach people that those are directly correlated, then I think the compliance with they won't even look at it as an injury prevention program anymore. What they're going to look at it as is a performance program, and that that to me is really a key thing is getting people to understand how this drives performance in a profound way. I know you get a chance to make a big-time positive impact on a lot of people through your instructional and, and educational courses and events. Uh, I mean, if I was able to be in the audience there to, to listen and learn from you, I mean, what's one big motivational message that you would have for, for someone in the audience? You know, the number one thing is don't ever give up. And don't ever let someone discourage you from what you think is possible. I, and and I, I run into this a lot in healthcare, and I just get so upset when you get physicians or uh, a therapist or an athletic trainer or anyone who will tell an athlete, you know what, this is not possible. And granted, we got to be realistic, 
but at the same time, I have seen people accomplish what most would have said have, would have never been accomplished. And the human body is amazing. If you, can, if you can improve the way that the human body moves, if you can mentally, the psychology of the athlete's uh, perception about their condition, about their status, about how they're going to do it, is absolutely critical to not only uh, uh, recovery from an injury, um, but also improvement in athletic performance. I know you know that better than anybody else, but I, I would just say again, don't let anyone ever discourage you. Dream the impossible and make it happen. Because I will tell you, you know, I would not be here today. I would not be doing what I do um, if I had listened to the very first person who discouraged me from ever going into my profession who said, you'll never get in, it's way too hard, but you know what? You can accomplish great things when you keep your mind at it, you, you focus on the right things, and, and it's amazing what the human body can, can achieve. Well, Dr. Nessler, thank you very much for your time. Uh, I appreciate you being involved with the project here. I took a bunch of notes, so I'm sure you and I are going to connect a couple more times here to, to keep uh, allowing me to learn from you. I mean, again, it was it's neat to see that uh, one email from a buddy of ours collectively uh, connected the two of us, and we get on the radio show, and then hopefully we're making a big-time impact on anyone who listened to the show. Uh, if anybody was listening to what we were talking about here who wanted to find out more information, I mean, how can they go about reaching out to you uh, and just finding about what you got going on? You know, they can uh, reach me by email, and it's Dr. C R T R E N T at aclprogram.com. Uh, we're also on Twitter at uh, ACL underscore prevention. Uh, we also have a uh, blog at uh, aclprevention.blogspot.com. Uh, in there, we do a, a, a weekly review of the literature. Uh, related to performance and injury prevention. And, of course, our website at uh, aclprogram.com. And uh, keep watching our website and our Twitter account because we have some amazing stuff that is going to be coming on the market in uh, June and July of this year that will blow your mind. It's, it's, uh, I, I feel very blessed to be where we're at, to work with the people that we work with. And I will tell you... I, we feel it will change the way we forever look at the lower kinetic chain, and uh, uh, it's going to produce some great uh, research opportunities as well. well. I look forward to getting that technology in my hands. Well, man, if it can help others achieve greatness, I'm all for it. So, again, Doc, man, I appreciate uh, you taking some time out of your day. I applaud you sharing your passion. I look forward to making, this, making sure this is a launching pad for us to do things in the future. And, uh, man, I, I just hope you have a great day, big dog. Let's keep in touch. And uh, thanks again. Thank you very much. It's an honor.